To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Good morning. My name is Laurel Perry, and I'm a member of the teaching team here at The Meeting Place on this, the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent, three Sundays to go until Resurrection Sunday. But it occurred to me, whoo, is right, but it occurred to me because of Resurrection Sunday, Resurrection Sunday can be any day. Should it be today for us? Yes, amen. May today be Resurrection Sunday for us as God opens his word to us. The theme chosen for this Lenten season is surrender, and the title I was given for today's topic is Surrender to Mercy. When I first read this, it struck me as a bit of a paradox, because when I think of the command to surrender, I think of it as coming from an enemy force. But today's invitation to surrender is coming from the force of love himself. And furthermore, when I associate the act of surrender as being followed by some kind of punishment of some kind, much like a prisoner of war would expect, not being shown compassion or mercy. But according to the Oxford Dictionary, that is the definition of mercy. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. And when I was talking about this with Pastor Paul, he pointed out that the word for mercy that Jesus used in today's parable actually had a much fuller meaning than this. The Greek word is helaskomai, and it means to make atonement for with a focus on the means for accomplishing forgiveness resulting in reconciliation. And Paul went on to say this word also carries the connotation of not just pardon, but being extended favor, grace, and oneness with the one extending the mercy. This word halaskamai only appeared once in the Gospels, and it was used in the context of today's parable when the tax collector was calling on God for halaskamai. Who wouldn't want to surrender to that? In preparation for today's message, I tried to recall a time when I was shown tremendous mercy, and one example immediately came to mind. I feel gross every time I reflect on this, but I'll share it. It was about this time of year, 24 years ago, when I was just finishing up my B.Ed. degree. I had a 4.0 average, and it was the home stretch when all of the assignments were coming due before graduation. And completing a Bachelor of Education degree involves submitting a lot of creative, thoughtful lesson plans for every teachable subject that you've signed up for. And... um, idea portfolios, it's lots of work. And I had spent a lot of effort and a lot of time on each assignment. And now I was down to my last one. Um, It was a lesson plan for teaching social studies and I had so many great ideas for it, but I had run out of time. I was racing the clock and I knew that if I didn't wrap things up soon, I would miss the deadline. But I had so many good ideas still, and I just wanted to finish strong. After all, this was my last assignment, so I knowingly let the deadline slip by, thinking, first of all, my professor likes me. Second of all, she's probably got her hands full with everyone else's assignments, and I really, really want to finish strong the way I I think it can be done. And so I knowingly let the deadline slip by, 
finished up my masterpiece assignment, got in the car, and drove to U of W, suppressing this growing knot that was in my stomach. And I walked into my professor's office, I handed her my final project, and I apologized for it being late. But my otherwise normally very pleasant professor had no smile for me that day, and I realized I had crossed the line. And she um, shared with me that I had put her in a very difficult position because she had told herself that she would fail any student who handed in their final assignment late. And there I was. No matter how strong my grades were, I needed this course to get my BA degree and graduate with the rest of my class. My whole degree was now hanging in the balance, and in that moment I realized the authority that my professor had and, and that she would be perfectly justified in following through on her predetermined punishment. Whether or not I passed her course now depended entirely on her decision to extend mercy to me, which I didn't deserve. I had taken her favor for granted, yet even though it went against the commitment she had made to herself, she chose to overrule this consequence and not fail me. Just give me a D on what I had tried to make an a assignment. And it was such a sobering and humbling way to cross the finish line of my degree. And to this day, I feel gross when I think about that attitude I entered my professor's office with and the look of disappointment on her face. I am indebted to her mercy. Now, I'll just give you a moment to recalibrate your opinion of me after what I just shared. <laughs> but please know that I share your judgment and disappointment, and I hope that this message redeemed that awful experience. Um, I had kind of walked into my professor's office that day like the tax collector in today's parable had walked into the temple, banking on my past performance and presuming favor. It's very obnoxious. But a transformation did take place in me when I realized I was completely at my professor's mercy as to whether I passed or not. I had no recourse. It was mercy or nothing. All of my hard work on the other assignments, answering questions in class, being a strong team player in group projects, meant absolutely nothing, since in the end, I had missed the mark and fallen short. And this is my segue to the horrible, wonderful news that I am here to remind us of today. No one is justified before God based on their A-pluses for living a good life, no matter how many A-pluses you have. It is pass or fail only. And, horrible news, we've all failed. We've all fallen short of the mark and depend entirely on the mercy of our teacher, Rabbi Jesus. The Bible declares in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is the reality each of us are sitting or standing in at this very moment. But the wonderful news is found in the very next verse, which is also our current reality. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Wow, like I'm just like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We are all sitting here, fallen short. We are all sitting here justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. In Jesus' parable, the Pharisee and the tax collector were in the same grim position before God, both having missed the mark, both having fallen short of God's glory. The only thing that differentiated them at that moment was that the tax collector knew that he was dependent on God's mercy, whereas the Pharisee was still confident in his own self-made righteousness. So, 
Where do you fall on the Pharisee tax collector continuum? Consciously or unconsciously, every one of us has probably compared ourselves to others in the past and felt confident in our own goodness at some point, perhaps even on a regular basis. But take heart. Jesus gave us our very own parable. Let's read. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. We'll just put the picture up there and I will read it to you. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus drove his point home by saying, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Parables have been described as a mirror that causes us to look at ourselves, and if we look honestly, the mirror becomes an open window into truth. Those listening to this parable who knew that Jesus was referring to them could respond in one of two ways, repentance or offense. And who knows, perhaps some of Jesus' listeners that day chose to repent and acknowledge their need to be reconciled to God through his mercy. Others, though, probably took great offense because after all, tax collectors were generally detested and seen as traitors taking advantage of their position for their own dishonest gain. Is Jesus implying that they are worse than tax collectors? We read in scripture that those who responded with indignation to teachings like these that Jesus gave ultimately put the wheels in motion for Jesus' crucifixion which ultimately put the wheels in motion for our redemption and theirs. Because the truth of the gift of salvation is, it is for everyone who surrenders to mercy in the end, Pharisees and tax collectors alike. Surrender does not come easily to us as human beings. Perhaps that's why we've dedicated a whole series to it in um, this season of Lent. Surrender is about giving up, not in the sense of throwing in the towel, but in the sense of offering up parts of ourselves that are otherwise in a state of resistance toward God or encroaching on territory that he alone wants to rule. You might recognize this band. My husband, Daryl, and I are both fans of the rock band U2, though Daryl has been a fan much longer than I. And in fact, he told me that it was a prerequisite to us getting married that I liked U2. <laughs> so needless to say, we've been enjoying their music for many years. Um, but more recently, we've really enjoyed listening to the audiobook autobiography by Bono, and Bono is the lead singer of U2, and he's also a Christ follower. He titled his autobiography, Surrender, and in a Times Square interview with ABC News the day his book was released, he was asked why he chose this title, and here was his response. Surrender is a word I haven't yet fully grasped or fathomed, if I'm honest. I was born with my fists up, metaphorically, sometimes physically, and putting them down is hard for me, and so I'm trying to. So the title is where I'm headed rather than where I'm at. Surrender is where he's headed, not where he's at. Surrender is 
a destination, a goal, likely not to be fully reached by any of us on this side of heaven. Surrender is the starting point of life with Christ, and maturing as a follower of Christ involves moving in the direction of increased surrender to him day by day by day. Bono said he was born with his fists up, but one could say that all humans, metaphorically, were born with our fists up because at the core of our fallen nature is rebellion against God. And surrender is the antidote to rebellion. Surrendering to God's will goes against our natural desire to be independent of him. But little by little, as we choose to let parts of our sinful nature be crucified with Christ, as scripture says, those same parts are brought into freedom and new life. N.T. Wright says, following Jesus means denying yourself, saying no to the things that you imagine make up yourself and finding to your astonishment that the self you get back is more glorious, more joyful than you could have imagined. But the fact remains that this resurrection of your new self is preceded by a crucifixion of your old self. And if crucifying your sinful nature does not sound appealing to you, what if I told you that our current state is even worse? The Bible says we're already dead in our sin. Being dead in sin is our default state of existence. Therefore, our choice is between death and death. One is death as a consequence of sin, and another is death by crucifixion of our sinful nature, which leads to new life. The Apostle Paul clarifies this idea beautifully in his letter to the church in Ephesus. He wrote, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, for it is by grace you have been saved. The Pharisee, the tax collector, you, me, we are all the same. There is no one in this room who needs Christ less than the person sitting next to them. We are all equally dead in our sin. <laughs> there is not degrees of deadness perhaps just degrees of our awareness, of our deadness. And what differentiates us is the posture we assume before God as sinners. Let's go back and take a quick look at our parable friends, the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself to pray, likely so he would stand out, whereas the tax collector stood at a distance, and who knows, maybe he even hid himself in the crowd. The Pharisee compared himself to others and thought he was doing pretty good, whereas the tax collector compared himself to God and couldn't even raise his eyes to heaven. The Pharisee focused on his perceived self-sufficiency, whereas the tax collector focused on his sinfulness and his need for mercy. The tax collector surrendered fully to God's mercy because he was convinced he had no righteousness of his own to come before God with. The Pharisee, on the other hand, seemed to think that God rates our righteousness on a kind of bell curve, comparing us with the rest of humanity. And the best we can hope for is that we come out ahead of the curve, but this is not the metric that God uses for measuring righteousness. This is the metric God uses. 
God measures our righteousness on the cross, the intersection of our sin and his mercy. It is where 0% of our righteousness even registers and 100% of Christ's righteousness is bestowed on us. This good news extends to the best of us and the worst of us equally. Righteousness is not a prerequisite. According to Jesus, it seems the only prerequisite is humility and repentance. Righteous living is a response to the mercy of Christ, not a prerequisite to receive the mercy of Christ. Rest assured, the tax collector, after he surrendered to mercy, he did not go back to living the way he was before. We are not saved by our righteous actions, but righteous actions are the expression of our salvation. And there is a cascade of promises in Scripture linked to living righteously. Prayers are more powerful. Your conscience is clear. You're living in right relationship with others. You're spared so many natural consequences of sin. The Apostle Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy, that he should chase after righteousness. He instructed him to flee the evil desires of youth and to pursue righteousness, not on his own, but along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In community, living as Christ with the people of Christ. And allow me this. I'll tell you where that's found in the Bible. It's super easy to remember. 2 Timothy 2.22. Say that with me. 2 Timothy 2.22. Super easy to remember. And if you can memorize that, you have half of Pizza Hotline's phone number memorized. <laughs> the same time. So my prayer for you is from this day forward, every time you go to bite into a slice of pizza, you will remember, ah, I am to pursue righteousness. That is my command in 2 Timothy 2.22. Um, so keep pursuing righteousness. Keep calling your mom and telling her you love her. Keep volunteering in children's ministry. Keep being a good steward of the environment. Keep loving your grumpy neighbor. Don't stop. The rewards of righteousness are great, yet no one is immune to becoming self-righteous in the process. We're no less at risk than the Pharisee was. In this parable, it's humility that Jesus highlights. The humble are exalted, he said. Humility is our safeguard from self-righteousness, and humility involves constantly circling back to the cross, surrendering to mercy, reminding ourselves again and again that on the scale of righteousness, we are 0% and 100% at the same time. Humility pairs very well with righteousness, and Jesus perfectly embodied both and invites us to as well. Our marching orders are found clearly in Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus exalted the tax collector in today's parable because of his humility and raw honesty before God. His invitation to us today is to step into that same raw honesty and humility and surrender to mercy. His invitation to us tomorrow is the same. And so is his invitation the next day and the next. This is our life's work after we choose to follow him, to daily take up our cross, to daily yield more and more of ourselves to be like him, to daily choose to die to the thoughts and desires of our sinful nature, which is very difficult to do. But every micro surrender to God ultimately leads us to more life, true life. So I invite us now to stand and before we're led in worship, Let's take a moment now to walk in to the temple to pray, to join the tax collector and the Pharisee there, to come before our rabbi Jesus, to search our hearts and ask him, what is the next step for us? 
You can even make a fist and ask God, what's in it that he wants you to surrender to him next? It's different for every one of us. What is it, Lord? What's the next thing between us that you want me to release my grip on and surrender to your mercy in exchange for new life in that area? Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your invitation into your favor and grace and oneness with you again. Thank you for that restoration. Thank you that because of Christ, we can all stand before you now clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And God, we want to live humbly and rightly before you. May our lives be a daily living response to your mercy until the day when we will be like you because we will see you face to face. We long for this day and we worship you now. Well, I have more good news for you, Laurel. Uh, the very first person that texted in said, A++ for me. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Tell my professor. <laughs> Thank clearly, uh, clearly, they would have uh, been very gracious to you, and perhaps you wouldn't have received that very, um, uh, well, heavy D that you received, right? Like, okay. that's, that's hard to receive. So they're good for you sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You've said some things that are hard to hear. You said that we are dead both ways. One in our sin, the other in Jesus. What made you choose death in Jesus for yourself? I said some heavy things, and I'm just saying I'm not making this stuff up. Like, I'm delivering what is in God's Word, and it's powerful, and my heart gets pierced by it as I'm studying it. And as that revelation comes, it's like we still get to choose, but death is the end station of sin. So what made me choose death in Christ? Um, it wasn't presented that way to me when I was four. Um, I was just told that I could have a pure heart if I believed that when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, it was to pay for all of my sin. And I was only four. And I, I wasn't a really bad kid, but I just knew my heart wasn't pure. And the thought of having a pure heart, like, was so... Um, I was just so excited. And so it was a guest speaker that day, church basement, linoleum floor, and I asked uh, Jesus to come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. And I was like, oh. I remember going into the coat room later where people are putting on their coats and my mom's chatting with people in the foyer. And I'm like, mommy, 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 I asked Jesus into my heart. I said, she's like, yeah, that's nice, dear, that's nice, dear. And I was like, ah! like, like do you realize what this means? So, so by God's grace, he met me as a four-year-old. Um, and my parent, my mom was a very new Christian at that time too. So he met my mom. My mom went to church, brought us. I heard the gospel, and I think that's why I like to teach preschool downstairs in children's ministry, because I'm like, I totally could grasp the, the power of what my teacher was saying to me, and if a child can embrace the truth of the gospel at that age, they can be spared so much of um, the consequence of sin mm. uh, as they go through their life. So it's one of God's mercies is that I got to hear of him, hear his truth when I was small. So Amazing. Thank you for sharing your personal story behind it. And yes, I think it's good that perhaps it wasn't presented to you to choose between this death or that death as a child. <laughs> okay, children. <laughs> Light up on this side if you want this. <laughs> I don't imagine that's the way you teach downstairs, so we're grateful for that. <laughs> it's not. Trust me, it's not. 
So, oh, yeah. but here's, here's, the, here's the news. So here's, a, here's another text. We often feel bad about ourselves. Yeah. To be like the tax collector is really hard. Yeah. Like there's a humility in the way he approaches the presence of God. Do you have any advice for someone who, uh, yeah. Feels heavy yeah. by that. I know, I was typing in, I'm like, oh, this feels so, so heavy. Because for most of us, no one needs to tell us that we're broken. No one needs to tell us that we've messed up. And so we, can, we carry that. And it's just the caution in the parable Jesus was saying. He wasn't talking to the people that know they're broken. He's talking to the people who don't know that they're broken and they are. And so don't let this message make you feel heavy. Just know that at the cross, um, there's no prerequisite. There, the wholeness isn't required before we come to the cross. And that, uh, that we are clothed in righteousness. I, I googled uh, clothed in Christ, and all these beautiful images came up, but I didn't get them. But there's one of Jesus standing behind someone just draping them with a white robe. And if you could just have that image that you are enveloped at whatever stage you're at, you're enveloped, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And that's why I, a sinner, could get up here and speak this heavy truth, not because um, I'm righteous, but because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And it's so awesome how Christ lets us step into his identity and cloak ourselves in his identity. And that's the only way we can stand before God one day. And, and so I pray that if you're down on yourself, uh, get your eyes on, off yourself and onto him because our truest identity is reflected mm. in his eyes. We see what he sees when we look into his eyes and we're reflected there. And that's who he wants us to grow to become. And our, our commission as well is to see others as God sees them because he sees who he always had in mind when he created them. And uh, yeah, so it's, I, I was also reflecting back there like surrender is so hard to get to. But once you're on the other side of surrender, it is this place of repose and peace and freedom because you're just yielded. And so but it's such a struggle to get to that point. But once you're there, what a beautiful space to live in, right? And think, oh, what else can I die to <laughs> so that I can know that more? But as long as we live in this earth, I think we're always going to be in the tension of like... Yeah. Um, and I always think like it's not, you know, it's like not good days or bad days. It's like every moment, every thought is uh, an opportunity to surrender. Yeah. So. Thank you again for sharing. Thank, Thank you. you for teaching. Would you close our service? I will. Thanks. Thank you. So, yes, church, um, my blessing for us as we leave is surrender to his mercy. May you go clothed in Christ pursuing his righteousness with the people of Christ in the humility of Christ to the glory of Christ. Amen. Go in peace. Have a good week. Bless you.